uh, let's get going. So, uh, you know, thanks for coming to this. My name is Tom Coleman, as you know, and I was a uh, chief information officer at a manufacturing company in Chicago area. Uh, I retired about two and a half years ago, and I've been working on climate change ever since. And uh, I did the CRP training in July. Uh, you can reach me at that uh, email address anytime or through the chat, thomas.f.coleman at outlook.com. With regard to EVs, I got my first hybrid in 2009. It was Camry uh, hybrid. It was excellent car. Then I got uh, a couple of Chevy Volts after that, which were plug-in hybrids. And I'll talk about those in a bit. And uh, then I got a Chevy Volt, which is different than a Volt. You know, a lot of people get confused between those things. I got that in uh, 2018. And then uh, we bought a, a Volkswagen uh, e-Golf um, in 2019. So we have two right now. So uh, the goal of the presentation, as far as I can do, is trying to do an overview of the topic, okay, for everybody that's interested. People also that might want to be on the campaign to do some uh, work to proliferate EVs. Um, but it's also going to cover a little bit more detail than I would normally do with somebody if I wanted to do a you know 30 minute overview. So this is packed with a lot more information, which climate people would tend to be interested in because you're dealing with people and trying to help people move towards EVs, etc. So you know I'm I'm covering uh, some of that. So why don't we get going? So the agenda is kind of packed. It's uh, emissions imperative, a brief EV history, automaker and uh, EV availability and investment plans, the EV market and end of life plans, um, the value proposition and some myths, uh, the EV uh, perception, uh, EV campaigns and possible team topics. So uh, let's move in. So the first thing is a quote from the CEO of Shell Oil Company. He said, you know, Shell, let me, uh, I've got to minimize that, uh, you know, the boxes. Okay. so." Uh, uh, climate change is the biggest challenge facing the energy industry, but the uh, energy industry is not the biggest challenge for a world trying to um, tackle climate change. Uh, we just sell what customers want. So when I heard that, I was encouraged at first that it, he considered it a big deal, but then he said, we're just selling what customers want. So all this, you know, gas and oil and fossil fuels and all that, they're just doing loyally, you know, supporting their customers. And I really don't buy that because they market these products that are not only pollution, uh, pollute the, the atmosphere, but also uh, greenhouse gases. So uh, you've seen Gore's chart. I won't spend much time. You know that there's tremendous amounts of uh, 152 million tons of global warming pollution going into the atmosphere. And you can see that it's made up of greenhouse gases on the left and poison gases. I like to separate them because they're different. One is poison and unhealthy, and one is warming the planet. So let's first look at a budget for carbon. So if we're going to look at what EVs and how EVs help the situation, we have to look at the tremendous increase in emissions over time over the last 70 years. You've seen Gore's chart. This one here, we're going to focus on the green, the oil, okay, that is refined into gasoline and diesel fuel. And if we set that si aside, we also want to look at this budget that we have and think of our atmosphere like a bucket that we're filling with emissions. So as you see it grow from the 1800s over time, you can see the USA, the uh, European Union, um, China, India, all coming into play. And if we were to look at the carbon budget for 1.5 degrees, which is now looking more like two for sure, um, We've really got a problem because we only get about 9% of the budget less, actually less than that, because now, you know, we're moving into 2021. So uh, we've wasted quite a bit of time. I won't say we wasted it, but we certainly didn't optimize what we're doing. So on the left, that's about the rate of emissions. And on the right, that's about the cumulative emissions in the atmosphere. So notice, for example, we all know that China is the greatest emission, the country with the greatest emissions on the planet. But the USA has put way more emissions into the atmosphere that's still there um, than China has, almost double, almost triple actually. So moving ahead, how does transportation, so we drill down and we look at transportation, which is 29% of US emissions according to the EPA. Now it's less on a worldwide basis, but it's 29% in the USA and it's about that in the European Union. 
So we're not gonna focus on all these things in the pinwheel here, but we're gonna focus on the red, the 29% from autos, trucks, buses, et cetera, which are largely burning gasoline and kerosene in the form of diesel fuel and jet fuel. So we're gonna drill now right into that 29% and look at an area chart from the IEA, which on a worldwide basis, this is the breakdown of uh, CO2 emissions and what they're projected to be over time based on their modeling. So you can see in the up here, hopefully you can see my cursor, uh, you know, up here we have the purple uh, aviation ships, medium and heavy duty trucks, pretty big buses, light commercial vehicles and passenger cars. And down the bottom, really not much would be uh, two and three wheelers like motorcycles and trains. Fortunately, in most of the world, trains are electric. We have some work to do. So when we look at passenger cars, you can see it's huge. And in the green arrow would be today. Here we are today. And this is what they're projecting over time is going to happen. So when you look at it, they're basically saying the dotted line says that uh, basically motorcycles, the emissions are going to go to zero by 2040 from the motorcycles. I guess the assumption is they're all electric. Rail is 2050, light commercial 2055, and then passenger cars and buses and minibuses uh, 2070. Uh, now, when I first looked at this, I was pretty upset because we can't wait till, you know, to, to get rid of these emissions to 2070. But really basically we're saying is we're taking the emissions, but there's an awful lot of cars and trucks and everything on the road. So even if we start putting EVs, you know, 100%, you know, you can't buy an ICE car. We're gonna just put EVs in, in place. We've got that uh, <clears throat> backlog or that uh, buildup of cars that are already on the road and the average passenger car is on the road for about 12 years. So if you kind of do the math, that's how, that's how they're saying it's trailing out over time, which to me is kind of scary. And if we were look at what the EPA says um, for, for the United States, they say that light duty uh, vehicles, uh, which would be cars and, and pickup trucks and that sort of thing, 59% of USA transportation. So I know this is a strange way of looking at it, but 29% of USA emissions is transportation. And of that, 59% of that 29% would be light duty, light duty uh, vehicles, which is kind of what you see in the blue. I hope that's clear to everybody. So we've got a big issue to deal with when we deal with cars. So the transformation is really about how do we get the lowest total cost? How do we get the lowest emissions? How do we get a car that performs really well? And how do we frankly get a better car you know, we want a better car, don't we? So let's move into this, a brief history. So first of all, the most important thing to at least have a basic understanding is, is, the, is the difference between an ICE car and an electric car. And first we have to start with an ICE, you know, internal combustion engine versus an electric motor, okay? So if we look at the, uh, the animation on the left-hand side, that's a four-cylinder internal combustion engine. And you can see yeah. that here, the wheel is spinning over here, and this would connect to the transmission in the wheels of the car. So this is a rotating uh, machine, okay? And what happens is these pistons are connected to this camshaft here, and then gases, mix, uh, ga uh, uh, gasoline uh, vapors are mixed with uh, air, and they come into the cylinder and the spark plug blows it up basically and shoves the piston down. And then the emissions go out eventually to the catalytic converter and the tailpipe and all of that kind of stuff. So this machine, uh, there's six cylinders, eight cylinders, even 12 cylinder versions of this thing. They convert vertical movement to rotation and they're only 20% efficient, which means 80% of all the energy that's in that gasoline in your gas tank is going right out the tailpipe. So this also, is, is pretty, it it's, uh, requires a complex transmission and clutch. In the old days, cars had manual transmissions and you'd shift from first gear to second gear and third gear. And you might wonder why that is. Well, it's because the way torque and power works in this machine, this internal combustion engine, um, you have to have a, you have to shift because the, the, the engine has to be going very fast to have any power. So even a Porsche or a Corvette that has let's say 400 horsepower doesn't have it unless it's winding up to eight or 9,000 RPM revolutions per minute. 
Okay, so I know that sounds a little complex, but I just wanted you to be aware of the fact that there's this torque curve where the, you have a lot of complexity, not only in the internal combustion engine, but you should see automatic transmissions. They're one of the most sophisticated complex, complex devices on the planet. So now let's just look at an electric motor. So here it is, uh, two poles, you've got the magnets in there and you apply electricity to this thing and it spins. So there's no conversion of vertical energy to you know, uh, circular energy, it's circular. It's 75% efficient. Okay, it's not 100%, but nothing's 100%. 75% really good. And there's no transmission. An electric car, even if you have the most expensive Tesla, has really no transmission in a conventional sense. It's one speed forward in reverse, okay? So you, this motor, you just make the motor go faster to go fast, to make the car go fast. So you don't have to shift because there's no torque uh, issue with, with an electric motor. It has, if it's 200 horsepower motor, you got all 200 horsepower while you're sitting there at a street light and you just punch it and it's a, all, it's there without having to rev up. So there's no transmission, there's no clutches. And the great thing about this is if you apply electricity to a motor, it spins. But if you don't apply electricity to the motor, but you force it to spin, in other words, the wheels of your car coasting, going down a mountainside or braking, this becomes a generator. So an electric motor is a generator and a motor. So what happens is electric car motors, one or more of them, generates electricity through uh, regenerative braking and puts the electricity back into the battery. So that's a really, this is really cool. So this is the foundation of the whole thing. So they started out in uh, 1832 and uh, the first practical model was there in 1884, about the same time as the internal combustion engine. And there's one in 1901, there's a, a third of all cars in the early 1900s were EVs. They were great things, you turn them on, they go. Trouble is the batteries had limited range. And that became a real issue where people wanted to go to the next town and the next town, and they really couldn't. And the investment really from automotive main, uh, auto companies and petroleum companies that wanted them to make gas cars uh, essentially was uh, put the technology into the gas car, not the, elect not the batteries. So over time, there were different electric cars. The first real production electric car that really went anywhere was um, the uh, EV1. Now there's a, there's a movie that you just got to watch if you haven't seen it called Who Killed the Electric Car? And it's about that car, originally called the Impact and then EV1. These things were developed in the early 90s, mostly because the government in California called CARB, uh, California Air Resource Board, insisted that a certain percentage of vehicles had to be you know, low emissions or no emissions. And Ford and Chevy and those guys started to make and test electric cars. Now this was successful. Over 1,100 of these vehicles were put on the road. You couldn't buy them, but you could lease them. And uh, they were great little cars, but you know, they were only two seaters. There was no back seat or anything. And uh, the 142 miles didn't seem like a lot at the time, but actually it was pretty good for the time considering they went from lead, bath, lead, uh, lead acid batteries to nickel metal hydride in the end. Now, as I said, there were the government really pushed GM to do this thing. They did a good job. The trouble is around, uh, uh, as time went on, um, the government changed in California and they decided to not make it mandatory to achieve these kinds of emissions and zero emission vehicles and all that. So what, uh, what General Motors did was they crushed them all. 1,100 perfectly good cars that were running on the road they sent trucks to put them on flatbeds and take them away and crush them all. And it was really between 2003 that happened. Only 40 of them existed, went to museums, and there's only one that actually still runs. The one in the, um, 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 what's it called? Uh, museum in Washington. Smithsonian, Smithsonian in, in Washington. Now, a couple of these that went, went to universities and so forth, um, they were supposed to be disabled. Well, they re-enabled them and they put them back on the road. So here's a wavered EV1 in 2005 that was captured by the police and taken away. Now, General Motors just let this go. In case, instead of working on a Volt or a Bolt or something like that, what they did was they started, eventually they started working on the Chevy uh, Volt. Batteries were wicked expensive at the time. And so what they did was in 2011, 
they made a plug-in hybrid. So it was a part-time EV. It would go 38 miles on electric, and then it would convert over to gasoline, like many, like the plug-in hybrids uh, do today. I had a 2012 uh, model of that. It was a really good car. And when I got rid of that, it had 65,000 miles, and uh, only 6,000 miles did the engine ever spin because it was mostly in EV mode. I would charge it home and charge at work, and it was great. Eventually, uh, Chevy uh, went to a, a more modern model, the 2016 uh, Gen 2, it was called, and it could go 53 miles. And I had a 2017 model, terrific car, part time EV. And then eventually they decided, you know what, it's really expensive to make a car that has all the gasoline engine parts, ICE engine parts, and electric car parts. So we're not going to be able to make money with that. We're going to have to focus on EVs, fully electric vehicles, and get rid of all that internal combustion engine stuff. So they came out with the Spark, <clears throat> which could go 82 miles from uh, 2013 to 16. And <clears throat> these were great little cars, and they were pretty quick. The trouble is they were small. They were really small and could only go 82 miles. And at the time, Nissan introduced the Nissan Leaf, and Volkswagen introduced uh, in California uh, the uh, the a version of the Golf called the E-Golf. And uh, my wife has an E-Golf, in fact, and uh, great little cars. And the Leaf and the E-Golf could do 82 miles, um, and they were quite spacious and roomy inside. So Chevy got rid of that. And they replaced it in 2017 with the Bolt. And it was a real breakthrough because <clears throat> in 2017, this car would go 238 miles on the battery. And uh, that was uh, more than any other EV except the Tesla Model S, which cost twice the money. So this car you could buy for about $35,000. And the Tesla Model S, I think, was twice that. So it was really good. Now that car is up to 259 miles of range. And there's a lot of electric cars I'll talk about coming out now. Now, there's technically there's uh, three kinds of EVs. The fourth one I'm not going to talk about is a hydro hydrogen electric uh, that uh, Toyota is working on. I'm not going to talk about this for there's a lot of reasons in this presentation, but we can talk about it at some point. So if we go into the pure hybrid like the Toyota Prius, I'm going to use the Hyundai Ionic because they're, they have all three versions. So, so you can compare apples and apples. So here's the hybrid, and you can't really run on all electric range on this thing. The electric motor and battery is really designed to help get really good gas mileage, and they do. The plug-in hybrid, on the other hand, um, you could plug it in, and uh, oh, I forgot to mention back here, how did the battery get recharged? Through regenerative braking, as I said. Going down a hill or braking, it would put power back into that battery, which then it would use later to help propel the car. Now these, they plugged in though, and you could get 29 miles of range and 52 miles per gallon, the, the uh, Ion, Ionic plug-in hybrid. And then over here is the fully electric Ionic <coughs> that could get 170 miles of range, which was great. Now, if you look at the MSRP, which of course you can do a better deal, you can negotiate uh, the MSRP down to a, a better discounted price. But using the MSRP, you can get a tax credit on the middle one, the plug-in hybrid, 45-43, and you can get a tax credit 7,500 on the fully, fully electric vehicle. And if you factor that into the MSRP, really the difference in prices between these isn't too much. So if you want to go fully electric, 170 miles is pretty good. You can do better in other cars. I'm just showing you one here at 170 miles. And uh, most people only drive 30, 40 miles a day anyway. So, uh, you know, most people, you know, you charge at night and it's got a full battery every morning. So 170 miles is pretty good. Now, suppose you want that SUV. Well, they don't, Toyota doesn't have an electric SUV. Uh, they do have the Toyota RAV4 uh, Prime uh, plug-in <clears throat> and that gets 42 miles of all electric range. And then the internal combustion engine kicks in. Now, it's very important to understand the ICE car versus the uh, EV, because really what we want to do ultimately is, is end up with electric cars, fully electric, zero emission vehicles. But I want to compare the uh, gas car to that. There's what's called upstream emissions and operational emissions. The upstream emissions in the gasoline or diesel car uh, would be from oil drilling, the transportation of the oil to the refinery, 
the refining of refining to gasoline to, to refine oil into gasoline or diesel, uh, diesel, transportation of the gasoline or diesel to the gas station, and then the cost of this catalytic converter, which helps to reduce the really bad poisonous gases like carbon monoxide. Unfortunately, these catalytic converters increase carbon dioxide by 10%. So what we've done is to reduce CO, which is a poison, but it's still there, it's still bad, but to reduce it, we increased emissions 10%. And we buy very expensive catalytic converters, which have uh, uh, palladium and platinum in them that come from Norilsk up in the, uh, beyond the Arctic Circle in Russia, which is one of the most polluted places on earth. Now, besides that upstream stuff, you have the operational stuff. So you have the, uh, once you start the, uh, the engine, you have the uh, poisons in the in form of carbon monoxide and, and sulfur dioxide and more. You have the greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and, and nitrogen di dioxide. And for diesels, of course, black carbon. Now, so how does the electric car stack up to this? Because people that talk to you and me are going to challenge you on a few of these things. So let's take a look at that. Well, here's the Hyundai Kona 2021 model, okay, of the, uh, of the uh, Kona. And let's look at the upstream emissions. Well, first of all, if you're on solar, wind, and hydropower or nuclear, there are no, there are no emissions. So most of our two electric cars, we have solar panels on the roof, so it's completely free and zero emissions, except once in a while I have to dip into it on cloudy days, I do dip into the grid. But basically, eventually the grid is gonna be more renewable energy. And then you have fossil fuel mix. Okay, so if you charge an electric car, what good is an electric car? Because if you charge it from coal, it still is bad, right? Well, even the, the national average is that an electric car charged from a, a mix of sources is equivalent to an 80 mile per gallon uh, gasoline car, according to the Union of Concerned Scientists. And also if you factor in battery emissions, oh, these lithium batteries are just as bad as fossil fuel. No, because when you drive that electric car for a year or a little bit more, you've made up for already, you've made up for the emissions that, that, to make that battery. And then um, once you're, yeah, and once you're driving the vehicle, there's no emissions, of course, okay? Um, yeah. Um, I have a Model 3, a Tesla Model 3, and I was told a mileage figure for payback on the battery manufacturing emission. And the figure I was given was 30,000 miles. Does that sound about right? Before well, it would be, you know, neutral. According to Union of Concerned Scientists, it's not. But I'll be honest with that. That, you know, that's going to vary depending on the size of the battery. So if you've got a Nissan, a Nissan Leaf, it's going to be a lot less than you know the the super duper you know 350 mile range uh, a car. But if you keep the average person keeps the car for 12 years, I can tell you, even if it takes a couple of two two three years, you're still better off. Okay. Right. Bye. All right, now I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but I wanna back up what I just said with numbers. So this is from the EPA, looking at Illinois and looking at the national over here. So you look at pounds of CO2 equivalent for an all electric car right here. And then you look at the, uh, the, the gasoline powered. And obviously the plug-in hybrids are a little better, but they're kind of in between, okay? And obviously the objective is to go all electric here. And this shows you the pounds uh, uh, EV. Now, once the grid goes, um, you know, renewables, then you're really better off. So about half the battery, including, according to a union, two-year study by Union of Concerned Scientists, about half the emissions, even with the battery, are paid off uh, pretty quick. So, hey, yeah. So, so it just if if uh, you know we've signed up for community solar, our, our development's not completed. But once that goes in, you know the 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 electricity we're using, why it may come from other sources, we're actually credited with the uh, uh, the, the solar. Uh, so we've offset that. So if 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 you use community solar. Uh, it would be, uh, you know, similar to what your situation is. Yeah, because because community solar forces uh, the company to buy renewable uh, credits. So yeah, I agree with you totally. 
Okay, now the full health benefits from the poison emissions and the greenhouse gas emissions does not happen fully by just deploying electric cars. We've got to get the grid. So we're not talking about the grid tonight, but I have to mention it because the full benefits come when the sources of electricity, such as solar, wind, and hydro, come from renewable energy. So that Nissan Leaf or Chevy Bolt or whatever you buy, you put it on the road today, and if you're charging from the grid, you know, not community solar, but regular charging from the grid, you're better off. It's a lot better off. But uh, unfortunately, uh, it's uh, it's not you know it's not perfect, if you will. It gets better over time, though. When that grid, for example, in Illinois, uh, we have uh, we have a lot of nuclear, but we have almost no solar, and we have some wind. So that mix, okay, is is really a kind of contaminating charging uh, by uh, charging an electric car. To some extent, it's better. You do it. But it's, it's, you know, we don't have to tell people go electric because it's perfect because it's not. So worldwide, we've got a billion four cars. I and mean, it's staggering. Think about it. And 250,000 cars are put on the road every single day. And in the United States, there are 287 million cars and only 330 million people. So almost everybody has a car or two. And we put 17,000 cars on the road every single day. This has got to stop. Because once they're on the road, they're on the road for 12 years on average. And each car emits five tons of CO2 plus the poison gases, okay, which are bad for the health. And right now, EVs are only 2% of passenger vehicles in the USA and 3% worldwide. So this is a real challenge. So what we got to do is we got to move off ICE to ZEV, or zero emission vehicles, convert the electric uh, to electrified uh, public transfer, to, uh, transit to the extent possible, re-implement enhanced CAFE standards, deploy synchronized traffic control systems, support the use of corporate teleconferencing to the extent we've got to expand the public charging uh, stations. Now, most people charge at home. I, I don't care about public charging. I charge at home. The only time I care is when I go on a trip. But Biden wants to increase it from 25,000 to 400,000. That's good because there's not enough public charges out there. Now, we also want to standardize these charging plugs because unfortunately, if you bought a Nissan Leaf two years ago, fast char charging is the same for home charging for all electric cars. But for fast charging, when you're on the road, the Nissan Leaf plug is called Chatamo, and that's different from a Tesla. And it's different from almost every other EV out there. So really, we need the government, uh, Illinois, et cetera, to start to take a stand on uh, standardization. Um, it's kind of like VHS and, and Betamax, you know, uh, over time, you, you got to go to one. The other thing is now you can get a tax incentive for getting an electric car. But what I think Biden wants to do is engage point of sales incentive. So you get that right then. You don't wait a year or so to get some, your money back, which is a bummer. And also we want to lift the EV sales criteria for incentives. Right now, there's a limit. Uh, uh, auto manufacturer, once they sell 200,000 cars, then the $7,500 limit phases out over the next uh, six months, I think it is. So Chevrolet or General Motors and Tesla, they're already phased out. So if you buy a Tesla now or a Chevy uh, Bolt right now, unfortunately, you don't get the tax credit. But if you buy a Nissan Leaf or some other car, you do. That's unfair. It's not right. To, it's not fair to the companies or the customers. Biden, I think, wants to do away with that crazy situation. The other thing I think we should consider is the uh, disincentivize uh, ICE vehicles. You know, in Norway, they don't do tax credits for EVs. That's right. But they tax the heck out of uh, ICE cars because they don't want you to buy them. And they are the most successful on a per capita basis deploying EVs. Okay, so what's the automakers look? You've probably seen um, Al Gore's chart here of auto manufacturers that are moving to electric vehicles. Uh, a lot of them, there's about 50 here. And on the left, you see the investments they're putting in. So uh, uh, most people don't know that Volkswagen is putting $30 billion over the next few years into electric vehicles. They're gonna take the didn't sell too much electric golf, e-golf, and they're gonna, they're introducing in Europe the ID4 and in the United States, the ID, I'm sorry, the ID3. And in, the, in, in uh, the United States, the ID4, 
next year. They're going to be huge, big sellers. They're SUVs and they're going to be great cars. GM just upped it to 27 billion from 20 billion. And then you see Hyundai, Toyota, and all these other companies. Kessler seems low at the bottom, but you know, they've invested for a decade. So, you know, they've really put a lot. Now in the pictures I've tried to uh, identify, just for your reference, some of the names of the cars that you see in the pictures, because you might want to go out and buy a Jaguar I-Pace if you've got a lot of money. They're expensive, but it's up to you. <laughs> now let's, let's take a look at a few, just a few of them. The Tesla Model 3 out here, the biggest seller, the biggest EV seller worldwide, $38,000 to $59,000. Battery range of runs from about 250 miles to about 322, depending on the model that you pick and how much you want to pay. Same thing, the zero to 60 can go in like 3.2 seconds incredibly fast. Or if you don't want to pay as much money, you get the 5.3 second version, which is still really fast. The Chevy Bolt, which is what I have, is on, on the right side. And uh, right now that's 259 miles and uh, zero to 60 and 6.3. You've got the Nissan Leaf in the bottom left and you've got the Hyundai uh, Kona on the, on the right. Don't forget, whatever the prices are here, it, unless as long as it's not a Tesla or a GM car, you can qualify, you may qualify for that tax credit. So the next list would be Ford. They're, they've, they've, they're coming out with a Mustang, an SUV Mustang called the Mach-E, starting at 44K. The Audi e-tron, the Audi uh, e-tron, very expensive, doesn't have real good range, 204. It's pretty good, but it's not great. Then there's the Kia Nero uh, EV uh, right there, uh, around 39K to 45, about 230 mile range, quick. And I mentioned the ID4 from Volkswagen. They're going to be everywhere soon. And you can order them now. <clears throat> We've got trucks out there, the Tesla trucks, the Volvo trucks, the Excelsior uh, buses. You've got in the bottom right, the Mercedes EV trucks in Europe, um, the uh, UPS trucks from Arrival, the uh, 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 small trucks from Rivian for uh, um, Amazon, which bought 100,000 of these, the GM, uh, is, is producing this pickup truck called the Hummer, 1,000 horsepower, one of the models, unbelievably powerful. If you want to convince people to get rid of their big, bulky uh, pickup trucks, which, you know, a lot of people like, put it, put it against this car right here, <laughs> or put it against the uh, Tesla Cyber Truck, 850 horsepower. You know who's going to win that tug of war. And then you've got the Rivian EV uh, pickup truck that's coming down the line next year out of a normal Illinois factory. So what's the market share of these things and what's the end of life plans? So I wanted to show you one plan because it's pretty good, not just because I have a General Motors car, I also have the Volkswagen. Uh, climate change is real, this is Mary Barra. It's real, you wanna be part of the solution um, by putting everyone in, in an electric vehicle. Now, Investment in America and American workers, 27 billion. I mentioned that. 40% of GM's line will be EVs by 2025, 30 new EVs by 2025. GM and LG, which makes the batteries right here in the United States, early ones were in Korea, but now in the United States, will take up cars to 450 miles, unbelievable. The R&D development's running good even with COVID, 50% faster. And the battery costs are going to come down another 60%, which is really uh, astounding. And GM is so committed, they basically said, Cadillac, you've got to take the lead here against Tesla. And uh, we invite you to take a buyout and leave your uh, franchise of uh, Cadillac or invest 200000 in electric vehicle supply equipment, like chargers and things like that, to support the new EVs that are coming soon. Make a choice. A lot of uh, dealers are, are getting out, by the way. Here's their new Cadillac that's going to be coming out called the Lurek. So how's America doing? Well, you can see here in the first half of 2020, the Model 3 is the big winner. Then there's the Y, the X, which is an SUV. And the uh, Y is kind of a SUV uh, crossover. The Bolt, a, a small crossover. Uh, Tesla Model S the Nissan Leaf, the Audi e-tron, and the Porsche Taycan. Then over here, you can see over 10 years, the Tesla Model 3 has sold 
thousand vehicles worldwide in only three years. It took Nissan 10 years to get 490,000. Something's going on here at Tesla. They're doing something really right, aren't they? And part of it, I think, has to do with not only a good vehicle, but a vehicle that is being marketed for what it is without the burden of internal combustion engine stuff hanging over their head to have to worry about. But that's just a side comment by, my, by me. So top light duty vehicles are cars in uh, um, light duty. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Can I, can I just ask something about uh, Tesla? Yeah. Um, what, I was listening to a presentation uh, by uh, Proterra the other day about buses, electric buses. And they said that they, uh, that an Electrify America said it too, that Tesla has its own charging infrastructure across the country, which is maybe another reason that Tesla has cornered the market. And I wondered if you have any comment about the relationship between the EV, either resistance or, or moving toward EVs that has to do with the charging infrastructure and not the car. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about that a little, but I'll just say right here, Tesla said, everybody else is fooling around. Infrastructure is a major issue preventing people to go to my cars. I don't care what they say, I'm coming up with my own fast charging infrastructure and I'm gonna put them everywhere. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just going to do it. So that's Elon Musk getting it done. He's right. Now, everybody else is woke, has, has woke, I guess you could say. And now there's Volkswagen spinoff, Electrify America, and all of these other companies. I think in the end, this will come together. This is just my speculation. Nobody wants to be alone. We don't want VHS, uh, you know, tape decks and and uh, you know, uh, Betamax, like in the old days, we need to come together on you know, uh, plugs and charging and everything else, because fundamentally the charging behind the plug is really the same. But yeah, they didn't wait, they went out and did it. In the end though, the other companies are gonna gang up on Tesla and they'll probably have like way more charging plugs around the country than Tesla will be able to possibly afford to do. But that's speculation, we'll see what happens. So let's look at this on the left. China's got 3.3 million EVs, more than anybody in the world. Europe's at about 2 million. The United States at 1.6, half of them in California. And this is about 7 million on the road. And when you look at the breakdown here, you can see that 55% of cars in Norway are EVs, up from 49%. Again, more every car that goes on the road, the chance is it's going to be an EV. And by 2025, it has to be an EV. The United States is sitting at 2%. China, yep, double us, 4.4%. Go get it. Now, this is an updated version of uh, Al Gore's chart that basically lists all the countries and when, how, when they're going to start phasing out internal combustion engine. So, uh, you know, if we look at this, you can see Australia, California. The green is kind of a go. The yellow is... Tom Coleman doesn't like it. So when California said they're gonna do 2035, I didn't like it because I don't think it's fast enough. So I made it yellow. Canada, 2040, give me a break. Costa Rica, 2050, come on. So you can look down the list. You can see the leader is Norway at 2025, all cars. Everybody is gonna, in my view, start to amp this up because when people find out and learn about electric cars, they're gonna want one. Everybody I know that's got one would never have anything else. They would never go back because they're better cars. I'll talk more about that in a second. So what's the value proposition? Well, we're starting to get into it now. An internal combustion engine car, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. An in, internal combustion engine, why is that there? Uh, okay, whatever, sorry, I'm gonna have to, I'm having a little trouble. I'll deal with it. Uh, short battery range is a concern. It's a myth now. It was true like four or five years ago, but it's almost a myth now because a gas tank that's full gets you about 338 miles. And now we're up to 260 and heading to two to 300. Many cars have got 300 right now. And over the next year or so, they will be. And the average driver only goes 30 miles a day. Now there's a paradigm shift though. In a gas car, you fill up the tank and then you drive several days, maybe a week, 
until it gets low. And then you search for a gas station. Usually you can find them, but sometimes it's at an inconvenient time. Oh, I can't, will I make it to work? I don't have time to stop, that kind of thing. With an electric car, it's always full when you start the day because you plug it in at night like you would a cell phone kind of a thing. And my car, if I forget to plug it in, it sends me a text and an email that says, hey, you forgot to plug me in. So I can't forget it, okay? So I, I, you start every day full, you don't worry about range unless you're on a trip, then it becomes an issue. And you can see a 10 minute uh, gas filling at a station for an EV becomes an 80% charge, might take a half hour to an hour to get 80% of this range up here back. So this is where you put charges in parking lots at malls and things like that. You could do a little shopping, you come back and it's done. So you can multitask that. At home, you plug it in and you go in, have dinner, go to bed, go to sleep. You wake up, there's no 10 minutes to fill it up because you just plug it in and walk away. So it's mostly a non-issue. I don't want to play it down. We need to get the infrastructure better, but it's not what people think because you think differently when you have an electric car. So let's get into that public infrastructure just for a little bit. 85% of people with EVs charge at home. Now it's a little bit of a challenge if you have an apartment. Apartment, um, people that own apartment complexes are really under pressure now because people want to buy an EV and have it. So your condo, your, your, uh, your apartment association, they, th we need to work on that because some people can't charge at home. So what they do is they might charge at work if that's possible, or they'll charge, uh, let's say they'll go out to lunch and plug in for an hour during lunch and get uh, you know energy, a lot of energy back. Now there's 26,000 locations, Biden wants to take it to 450,000. At the 26,000, it's 84,000 plugs. <coughs> and these are the companies that are out there, Electrify America, a spinoff from VW, Tesla, et cetera. Now, every one of these is, is pretty much, pretty much all of them are compatible except Tesla. Nobody can use Tesla's except Tesla. Tesla cannot use anybody else's either. The slow speed charging, everybody can use those, okay? It's a technology thing. There's fast charging, there's level two charging and level one. Level two charging is 240 volts like you would have in your house. Everybody, the plugs are the same, okay? Uh, the, the, there's a difference, Tesla has a difference, but they have a little adapter for it. So everybody can charge the same. Now, but when it comes to DC fast charging, really throwing the energy into that battery because you're on a trip, Tesla is completely separate from everybody else. Everybody else pretty much supports the same charging standard nowadays. There's a little variance here or there, but that's where we stand. So there's some, some things the government should do to standardize. Now you also, uh, when you're on a trip, if you're staying at a hotel, there's apps that tell you whether the hotel has a charger. A lot of people don't even know it because they're in the back of the building or whatever. Malls have them, parks have them. And so most of these are free, by the way. You plug in, you spend an hour shopping and you pick up 25 miles type of a thing. And locating a charge is easy. It's, it's easier than gas probably because apps like PlugShare show it to you. I'll show you a picture in a second or the car's navigation. And I mentioned about apartments. So on the extreme right side, you can see Chicago, the plug share app showing the charging stations in the Chicago, uh, immediate Chicago area. The orange ones are super fast. The green ones are slower. And then you can see the one to the left of the one on the right around Naperville. That, uh, that's where I live. So that's what's around. I don't care. I never use them because I charge at home. But if my charger broke, I would use one of these or I would top off the battery if it was free somewhere, you know, that I went. And, <coughs> excuse me, on the left is uh, our Volkswagen and our Bolt charging up and there's the charger there. They cost uh, anywhere from about 300 to, to, to $500, depending on what you buy. And they all work the same. And this, this, uh, this is a pretty fast one here. And uh, here we go. Now, as uh, Pam was, was mentioning this, this chart of Tesla, Here's the Myers right near my house. <clears throat> this thing just opened up and all the red ones you see over here, this, these are Tesla uh, fast charging stations. They're called superchargers. And you can see these Tesla chargers. This is brand new. Already within a few days, Tesla cars could see on the screen that it was here. So they're going down 88. 
and they say, whoa, I can get off at 59, come down 59, there it is, and, and charge up and then hit the road again. To the right of that is Electrify America. That's what my car and most EVs use, uh, plugs that are uh, compatible with Electrify America. So there's four stations with uh, two, four, six, eight plugs. Basically eight people can charge there. Now over in Germany, they're insisting that all gas stations have uh, chargers. Uh, I think it's a terrible idea because who wants to get stuck waiting around for a half hour, an hour for your car to charge? I'd rather go shopping in Myers or whatever, Walmart or whatever. In the top right is a picture of the United States of using the PlugShare app showing where they are. Clearly Northern Manitoba, you're not gonna take an electric car. So there are limitations, but it's not as bad as people think unless you're going into some pretty desperate places like over here or way up here. Now, uh, this is my car. People say, well, I'm afraid I'm gonna run out of battery. How will I know? Well, this is, uh, this is the fuel gauge right here, the green bars. Okay, so I've got a 90% charge right here because there's two more bars to go to get to 100%. And I've got 172 miles of range. I might be able to go to 205 or it could be as low as 141 miles. It depends how cold it is out and how fast I drive the vehicle. This will adjust though. Everybody pays attention to this one the most, okay? So you know in real time, all the time, how you're doing in terms of range. Okay, and then over here is an example of my center console showing me where the charging stations are if I don't want to use my app on my phone. Okay, here's the number three EV myth. They're expensive, right? <clears throat> EV fueling is one third the cost of an ICE car. It's about two to three cents a mile versus nine cents a mile. And that nine cents a mile is computing gasoline at something like $2.30, which is almost a record low for gasoline since the 90s, okay? Now you don't pay, when you pay $2.30 for the gas, gas is subsidized. Your money subsidizes fossil fuel companies, which make the price of gas artificially lower than it really is, little side comment. But even the way it is, it's one third the cost. Now it depends on where you live too, because electricity costs different in different areas of the country. And that's the same thing for gasoline. Now EV maintenance, according to Consumer Reports is half the cost of an ICE car over 200,000 miles. So you're gonna save four to $6,000 over 200,000 miles, less with an, with an EV than an ICE car. No tune-ups, no tune, uh, oil changes, no antifreeze, no spark plugs, no air filters, no bay belts, I could go on and on, no automatic transmissions, et, you know, et cetera. Brake pads almost never wear out because you know what? There's that regenerative braking that slows the vehicle without using the brakes, but you have them there if you need to stop quickly. And there's only 20 parts in an EV's drive system versus 2000 in a nice car. And the warranty of almost all EVs is eight years or 100,000 miles or more. So that means you really buy the car, you don't really worry about that battery or the electric motor and all that fancy new stuff. You don't really worry about that. Now the purchasing of an EV is often more expensive, but when you factor in the $7,500 tax credit, it could be close. It's not as bad as it looks. And parity is expected in 2022, between 2022 to 2024, according to Bloomberg. So pretty soon EVs will be really cost effective. And if there's a tax credit still, which Biden I think will continue, it's really gonna be a good deal. So what's the TCO? What's the total cost of ownership of an EV? According to AAA, you save $709 a year. According to uh, uh, Union of Concerned, uh, Concerned Scientists, it's $770 a year. And it's about $900 in uh, the city of Chicago. Um. So to, yeah, so the cheapest car is an EV. Pay a little bit more at first, get that tax credit, pay a little more at first, and then pay less over time. Tom, That's really what matters, okay? Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to mention that um, when I got my Tesla Model 3, you know, what you're saying here is all true, but I was surprised at my insurance cost went way up. Oh, they did? Yes, because, and the reason that was, that was given to me is that uh, for collision and for any um, accidents I'd have, Teslas and I suppose most EV cars are very expensive to repair. 
Um, and so uh, my my insurance cost tripled. Mine didn't but, change. And mine might mine didn't actually change. be less. I have a mine went, three and mine is not yeah. more expensive at all. Yeah, mine went up about $50. So I, I can tell you, I'm on five EV forums. You might want to look at a new insurance company because okay. some are going to screw you because you just bought an electric car, but others won't. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to take the time uh, on this uh, battery cost, but I did want to show you from 2010 how much cost the batteries have gone down. And energy is measured in kilowatt hours. It's like a gallon of gas, only it's electricity, okay? So you can see in 2010 how expensive each kilowatt hour is. And the grid underneath for a car like the, uh, the, the Nissan Leaf, they had a small 24 kilowatt hour battery. So the battery alone in the Leaf cost $45,000. It's no wonder Nissan didn't make any money on the Leaf. Okay, but hey, it did come down to 17,000 by 2012, 9,000 by 2015. And while it seemed to go up by 2017, look at the range you get and how much bigger the battery is here in this bolt, okay? And it's gonna to continue to drop like a rock, okay? Four EV myth. EVs are slow and really they don't perform well. They're like golf carts, you know, and they're not, you know, I, I, I drove one of those uh, Nissan, 2010 Nissan Leafs, and it was kind of, it wasn't that, it didn't perform that well. Okay, what's, it's not true anymore. <laughs> these, these things got 200 horsepower or more with instant torque. They all go zero to 60 in 6.3 to 6.5 seconds with the Model 3 getting 5.6 or even faster with the more expensive models, okay? And I mentioned the instant torque. And of course, if you wanna really blow a bankroll of money, one of the fastest car on the road today is the Model S Performance, 2.4 seconds to 60 miles an hour. Some people are into this, <laughs> so I mention it. Now, EVs are much more of a fire hazard, right? Cars, you know, burn up now and then, but you know, you don't hear about a car burning up that it's an ice car. It's just a car that burned up. But if it's an EV, oh, they bring out, the, oh, it's an electric car that just burned up, okay? But it's not true. According to the, the government, they're less likely to catch fire and kill their occupants than an ice car. You know, gasoline is pretty volatile, right? Now, they're undependable, though. EVs are undependable. By the way, these myths that I'm, I'm talking to you about, that's the top 10 myths from people. That's what people are saying, okay? So that's what I'm, I'm sharing it with you because they're going to say it to you. And I'm giving you the am ammunition, hopefully. So Forbes list of top car repairs, one through 10 are listed right there. There they are and how much they typically cost. And EV has none of this except a number four. It's got a fuel cap. <laughs> but actually the fuel cap is really a, a, a plug and it's a little bit more expensive than $15 for sure if there's a problem with it. But basically you don't have any of the others. You've got the warranty I mentioned. There's only 20 parts, as I mentioned, and you don't have mufflers, spark plugs, tailpipes, engineer filters, belts, automatic transmissions, radiators, fuel injection, catalytic converters, complex engines, spark plugs, oil, or antifreeze. And you don't have oil changes, antifreeze, transmission fluid, spark plugs. You don't have any of that to change. So the next one is, uh, you know what, the, uh, the lithium, um, lithium um, production of lithium batteries is bad for the environment, right? Well, you know, you, you got fossil fuels and they're bad, but you know, those lithium batteries is horrible, right? Well, uh, think about it. Fossil fuel, you got the drilling, the transportation, the refining, and, the, and, and, and then the transportation to your gas station. You've got your burning, you burn the gasoline, the pollution from the palladium and pl platinum manufacturing in Russia for the catalytic conver converters, it's dreadful the use of the catalytic converters that actually reduces poison emissions a little, but then increases uh, global warming emissions. So let's look at the lithium batteries. The payback is 12 to 18 months. I'm not, I'm not sure about it being longer than that, to be honest with you. you know, it, it really depends a little bit on the battery, I think, too. The countries should improve the way they deal with 
brine, the way lithium is mined, it's, they mine brine down in South America, but it's ore in other places. And it could be better, I'll be honest with you. They ought to really look, you know, improve that. But you know, it's other countries. You know, we have a tremendous capability of full lithium in the United States, but we hardly, you, we hardly do anything in the United States. We need to take control and do it clean. We also should redeploy and recycle lithium batteries. This company's amping up to do that. Now they know that there's gonna be a market for that. And then I mentioned the production in the United States. And we also should treat lithium as strategic because it's not just electric car, weapons, hydrogen bombs, you know, uh, computer technology, glass, metal, batteries, all require lithium. And you know, we ought to look at you know, like, uh, Toyota right now is looking at uh, solid state batteries. They, they want to have a demo going by 2025. And that could be incredible. Charge it up in 10 minutes type of thing. So the perception, we're coming towards the end now. The perception is 37% of the people have absolutely no interest. And I'm not sure we can move those people. They want their gas guzzling truck. And I could show you a picture of a truck where they actually tune the truck to emit as much black carbon and soot into the air as possible because it's cool. Some people think it's cool. But the would consider and the some interest people, I think we could work on them. And I think when people start to see stylish, fast cars and they get beaten out by an EV at a street uh, launching from a street light, they'll start to have interest, but we'll see. Now, so is this the new, is this the new suburban neighborhood? I mean, you got this beautiful house with the three car garage, the uh, red, the pretty red uh, car sitting there, isn't that nice? Well, no, wait a no, minute. no, Tom, you're missing the solar panels. Wait a minute, that's the next slide. You're jumping ahead. <laughs> the red car is an EV, the charger on the wall is an EVSE, the battery from Tesla is right there, and those solar panels are actually solar shingles on this house. So whether it's actual panels or Tesla sh sh solar shingles, this is, the in this is the vision of the new tomorrow. This is, to me, where we gotta take the world. It's not just the car, it's the home too, because the home is gonna charge, I mean, the car is gonna charge from the home. So to wrap up the last slide, the electric car campaign um, is, uh, some possible team topics. So anybody who's interested in being on the campaign, figuring out how do we proliferate electric cars? You know, some, you know, and I'll, I'll just look at, we, we need a, maybe a mission, a vision statement, maybe a core purpose. What are the goals of the thing? We'll have to figure that out as we have, launch our first meeting in uh, uh, January. What would we do? And, and some thoughts, I've, I've listed a bunch of things like dealer education. Uh, you know, some of the dumbest people about EVs are dealers that sell EVs. <laughs> They're horrible, okay? My dealer has one person that knows what she's doing. Other than that, if she's not there, nobody knows what to do. Uh, dealer business models. You know, when an electric car is sold, they make money on it. But they don't make any money after that because the car doesn't come back. <laughs> Because there's no maintenance programs, there's no oil change. But Tom, Tom, and that's an issue because most dealers make their money on the servicing end. Exactly. Yep. So it's a problem. So I think the electric car campaign needs to, you know, should we chat about that? Should we talk to dealers about what their plans are? What are they going to do when the whole world goes to EVs? And well, maybe that's we why Elon to... Musk said we don't need dealers. And ah, yeah, you have to look at the situation of do we really need dealers anymore? Exactly. You know, I, uh, I totally agree with you. I think dealers that have their, they're numbered. <laughs> I don't think Chevy, when they started firing Cadillac dealers, really cared. <laughs> anyway, I'll just list the others real quick on the screen. Lack of standardization, far, uh, fast charging. You know, we've got to bring this to a head. You know, there's the public charging infrastructure has got to be better. And one way to make it better is to somehow find ways to uh, get Tesla and all the other companies to work together on, the, on behalf of the whole public. Policy, government roles for incentives, uh, ICE taxes, should we tax a gasoline powered car? Um, should we, uh, I think Biden was thinking about cash for clunkers to get those ICE cars off the road. What about regulations? When we think about cigarettes, it took so long for people to look at cigarettes as poison, causes emphysema, emphysema 
and cancer. Well, is gas any different? Gasoline is no different. And the machine that uses gasoline, an ice car, I'm sorry if anybody's listening to me has an ice car. Think about it. That is a pollution machine. And it's a greenhouse gas manufacturing machine. So we got to think about thinking differently about electric cars as we go forward and help people, other people do it. And what would the role of oil companies be? There's some evidence that BP is really coming around on this thing. Hey, if we can get one or two oil companies to start doing the right thing, you know, that could bring people to work more together. And I think the electric companies have a tremendous opportunity to sell more electricity by taking it away from the gas stations. Where's the electric company gas stations? Where's the, up in Petrol Canada has electric car charging stations all over Canada. That was a gas company, you know, gasoline. And what about marketing EVs and training? Anybody out there, a marketing expert? Hey, we could use some advice on that and how to incentivize this. How should we train people on EVs? You know, maybe not this presentation, but maybe a subset of this that would be more applicable to the average person. You know, I'm, I'm really talking to climate experts here. So should people think differently about them? And what else should the, uh, the campaign consider? So that's about all I have. Uh, I thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Tom. Great presentation. Thanks, Tom. Um, I have a couple of comments. Um, first one is I was looking online, you know, to see like what I could get, um, you know, buy a used EV and the cost is still pretty high. And then I also stumbled upon the Volvo line that's coming out. Those are pretty nice cars. Um, prices, you know, pretty expensive still, but, um, yeah. you know, um, a lot, it seems like a lot of the car companies are, are going that direction, coming out with a whole line of cars. Um, I watched a presentation last month from the Chicago area Clean Cities Coalition. Um, they had someone from the USDOT on there, and it was uh, Michigan to Montana I-94 EV corridor. But I also found um, from that website, they have, um, a website showing like the whole country and all the segments that they've, um, they're trying to get grant money to kind of fill in the gaps. They think there's like a mileage requirement that they want to do for charging stations. And they were talking about the different levels too. So if anyone wants it, I think it's on their website. You, I think they recorded it and you could share it or look at yeah. it after the fact. Yeah, that'd be good. And you did mention something about used current automotive. They happen to be in, um, in uh, Naperville, mm -hmm. they, what they do is they have tremendous numbers of electric cars that they sell used. We bought, uh, my wife in 2018, we bought a 2016 uh, e-golf. Now the thing only gets 82 miles, but she just drives around town. It's perfect. She doesn't need, you know, 100, 200 miles or whatever. Yeah. This car is a great car and it only had 21,000 miles. It came off of lease from California. So it was cherry. It was just fantastic. Okay, and we bought it for like, I don't know, eleven, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. They have all kinds of Teslas at, at Current Automotive right now. Check them out. Okay, where is that at? Yeah, they're in uh, Current Automotive. You can, you can uh, you know, go online and see. They're in Naperville. Okay. Yeah, they're on Ogden. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I, I haven't been out much since the pandemic, so I haven't been driving <laughs> around. <laughs> yeah, but um, you, can go, you can go online and see their inventory. Oh, okay, last, great. Last time great. I looked, they had a lot of Teslas if you're interested. You know, it's kind of funny because you mentioned the Meyer, and I don't live, I live right on the, I'm on the Aurora side of the Aurora Naperville border. Oh, yeah. And so I haven't, like I said, I haven't really been out since March much. <laughs> and um, so that's so funny that that Meyer I used to go to all the time um, has all those uh, charging stations. And I have no idea because um, I haven't been out anywhere. But um, one question or comment I want to make, and maybe this is something that we want to include in the campaign or, or just think about or address, is that, you know, with, with climate change, we always talk about injustice as well, and how um, we're all trying to move forward, but then sometimes we are just leaving behind certain groups. And um, I know I saw an article or some kind of news article about um, that the charging stations in Chicago, that they're really... Pop, or they're really concentrated in some of the more wealthier neighborhoods and 
um, they're very, they're lacking a lot in the, in the not so wealthy neighborhoods. And it just brings to a point that, um, especially with the car prices, like, are we going to be leaving behind a whole group of people who can't afford these cars? And what do we do then? And then if gas prices go up, um, they kind of get put in the cycle where they can't afford to get out of it in a way. Um, and, you know, they're probably buying used cars. So like this whole process of, you know, of kind of cycling through the whole car um, lifetime, I guess you want to call it. So, you know, um, people that can't afford a new car or even a nicer new used car um, that they might be left behind and some of the poor neighborhoods and, and those kinds of things being the resources to them. I think Biden has plans to work that out, and I'm not sure of the details yet. Okay. Yeah, but I think uh, he, I, I remember reading in his plans that he's going to deal with that. I don't know if tax credits or how he's going to do it. Okay. Anything Great. else? Yeah. Email me. Okay, so I'll email you. Thank you. Tom, I, I posted on the chat the uh, web address for Current Automotive. Oh, beautiful. My co I, I would comment about the, the price, you know, as the, uh, the price of batteries goes down, uh, which it will continue to do as more and more manufacturers make more and more electric vehicles, they're going to become cheaper than, oh, yeah. uh, you know, gasoline powered yep. cars. It's, yep. you know, it's headed there. So yeah, right now it's harder for low economic uh, uh, folks to, to afford and, and get into a, a car, but 10 years from now, it's going to be better. And 20 years, it'll even be a lot better. There's you know, a lot of the cars uh, um, in China are very small and, and economic. In India as well, to the extent some of those come over, will reduce the, the base price. So I, I think there's a lot of fronts on that. That, that isn't going to continue. Yeah. Cool. Uh, did you get your Kia yet? Uh, so no, we're, we're uh, so uh, for those who don't know, no, Tom did not, um, um, he didn't have it on his slide because it's new, is the uh, kind of sister uh, EV to the uh, 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 Hyundai uh, Kona is the uh, Kia uh, Nero EV. On one of your slides, you mentioned it called E Nero. In Europe, that's what it's called. Here in the U.S., it's called the Nero EV. Oh, I thought, um, yeah, okay. It, 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 the car, it's the one we decided we were interested in, largely because it has more room in the back seat uh, yeah. than the uh, Kona. It's got a longer wheelbase, and so it fits our needs a bit better. Uh, it was not available in Illinois until just recently. It was uh, uh, it was only being sold in the 12 uh, 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 CARB, uh, California Research Board uh, states. Uh, but uh, um, Bob Rorman Kia in Schaumburg it just became, I think, one of the first dealers in Illinois to sell it. And they just recently took possession and uh, of their first ones. And we're going to, uh, it's, this is for my wife, replace her minivan, and we're going to go test drive it tomorrow. Beautiful. Yeah. Do people rent electric cars? I lease mine. Um, but is that, is that the shortest amount of time people could like try them out? Do they ever do like? A lot of people lease electric cars because they're afraid know. of the technology. Rent one. I don't, I don't think yeah. they're rental companies, but. I lease it, and the, the interesting thing I wanted to say about my lease is I, I got a three-year lease on a Model 3, and I, was, I had to sign an agreement that I will not buy the car back because the plan at Tesla right now is to take all the Model 3s that are leased and turn them into driverless taxi cabs at the oh, end. Wow. <laughs> so that's going to happen in three years. <laughs> And, you know, it sounds crazy, but that's Elon Musk. And yeah, yeah. I think he'll be able to do it. Yeah. Cool. Well, is that about it? On batteries, Tom? Yeah. yeah. You'd mentioned in the slide about enhancing the redeployment and recycling of lithium. As we get to this level of much more cars, is there an issue or could there be an issue with used batteries and disposal or do you assume that as this grows, we will have enough recycling to take care of it? Yeah, right now today, there's a whole bunch of companies looking at it because they see a big market coming up. 
because the real electric cars didn't start happening until around 2011 or so, okay? Like the Nissan Leaf. Those things are coming off the road now. Uh, some of the batteries are starting to not give as much range. So what's happening is they're redeploying the batteries to other use, not a car. The battery's being used for other use in many cases. In other cases, there are companies that are testing how to recycle these to get the, you know, the, the lithium out of these batteries, uh, et cetera. Now, what some companies are doing is a company in China is doing is you don't buy the battery. You buy the car, you don't buy the battery. You lease the battery and anytime you need a new one or whatever, you pull in and then you drop it out of the bottom of the car and, and put in another one type of thing. So it's interesting. There's going to be a lot of business models there. In Orlando, um, the city there, they're, they're, uh, they've done a lot with sustainability. I met the director of sustainability at a conference and talked to him quite a bit. But they have um, all electric buses. And they he said that when the batteries get to a certain point where they're not holding a char enough of a charge, that they've been using them um, with their electric utility to um, it's basically just like battery cells um, to store energy at the electric utility. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's what's happening. Anything else? Tom, I got I had a couple of questions about some of uh, 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 one was about one of your slides, the tra transportation goal with 29%. The first bullet uh, had in there after in parentheses, it said full EV, then it comma BEV which I understand to be battery EV. And then you had a second one, BEV. And one, what's the difference between BEV and full EV? And was there a third uh, type that was supposed to be there? It was mistyped. A ZEV, zero emission vehicle, okay. a BEV, battery electric vehicle, and a full EV, they're all the same thing. Okay. Okay. You're what's just what's saying, different you're, is- you, So on that slide, you were saying you might see these referenced this way. Absolutely. You go on the web, people call them BEVs. I got a BEV car. Yeah, other, yeah. other people say they call them ZIVs. I got a ZIV. So, so some of my questions on, on your experience with your uh, uh, electric cars is what, what charger did you have at home and what's the amperage, max amperage of it? Yeah, I have a Siemens. It's 30 amp. My car can handle 32 amps. So, so I think my, Tesla what? goes up to 40, but 32 amps is very good. So mine is a 30 amp. I got it at Costco. I got a great deal. It, 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 is, it, is the amperage selectable on yours? I, I, with some of them I looked at, you can select what amperage. And one of the things I read is that some of the battery life you might get might be associated with, you know, if you're ch always charging it on max amperage, like one I was looking at has a max of 32 amps, you, you reduce it where if you don't need to charge at 32 amps, you have, you know, 16 hours and, and you reduce it down to 16 amps that you'll extend the life of the battery. Okay. Yeah. The yeah, I mean, there's something to that, but I don't think it's major. The, the major thing that most electric car people do is they don't charge to 100%, okay? There's settings in all electric vehicles where you can set them to charge to 90%. I charge to 90%. The only time I go 100% is when I need 100% of the range. I need all the range, the miles that I can get, but on a typical day, I don't. So what happens is if you charge to 80 or 90%, the length of time that that battery will have its full range capabilities extended pretty dramatically. The, 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 the next uh, kind of question on that is, is I, I read that some of them uh, recommend you, and I'll use the term exercise your battery, you run it down lower, um, you know, in, in part they were talking about to calibrate the range calculator. Yeah. Uh, that if you don't, you don't ride it frequently, or you always ride it between let's say 50% and 80%, you know, when you get down to 10% sometimes, the calculation might not work real well. Yeah, but you know, it's not good to, to run your car down below 20%. Cars should be between 20 and, and 90%. Go 100 when you need to. Go down below 20 if you have to, to get home. But, but basically, you don't do it all the time. But I think you're right that you could do that every now and then if you felt the GOM, the gasometer, the range indicator. Everybody calls them GOMs because they're not 100% accurate, okay? But the range indicators, if they start to get off a little bit, you could do that, but. Thank you. I don't have any problem. Anything else? Well, thanks a lot, take care. We'll be thanks. setting something up in uh, January for those people who are interested and we can work on a lot of these issues. Thanks a lot, bye-bye.